rest in his love I will trust the Lord Oh my soul All right, you can get your Bibles out if you've got them. If not, it'll pop up on the screen. We don't have lift notes today. We will get back into that rhythm as we're finishing off the fast this week. We'll get back into that rhythm next week. Encourage you to take some notes, though. Key passages will be in Matthew 16, and then we'll be in 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27, and then back in Matthew chapter 7. So we just, right at this very moment, are concluding our fast. (laughs) And I want to just ponder, reflect, continue to consider what we were doing, why we were doing it. And the title of this message is The Joyful Fruit of Discipline and Self-Control. And uh, yeah, I, yeah. Woo. thank you. I have one person in here that's interested, and it's my wife. And she wrote half the message, so it's good, it's good. Yeah, more dancing, more dancing, yeah. You can dance in, the, in your spirit as we hear these, this good news of Jesus. Yeah, a joy and discipline, joy and self-control don't often get tagged together, but it is part of the upside-down reality of God's kingdom. So as we close out the fast, and we've got kingdom goals, God's vision, certain practices that you all I know have committed to between you and God and and maybe some close community to line yourself up with some of those goals and, and vision that God has for you this year. I want to re-emphasize that the fasting that we did, the saying no to certain things for for a season, from God's perspective, from the Bible's perspective, that mindset of fasting is not something to just do once a year, but it's really a way of life to see the kingdom advance. Because every time you fast, fasting is essentially saying no to one thing because you want a better yes. That's fasting in a nutshell. You say no to one thing because you have a vision for a bigger and better yes. So what I just want to lay out this morning a little bit from God, or a lot <laughs> from God's word is that Jesus models and teaches that that fasting mindset really is a way of life for a follower of Jesus. You could say that Jesus himself models and then teaches that as followers of Jesus, we live a fasted life where we're regularly, intentionally saying no to some things because we have vision for a better yes. That is the essence of self-control, which is the fruit of, a fruit of the Spirit. Nobody's favorite <laughs> fruit of the Spirit, right? It's right down at the bottom of the list next to perseverance, right? <laughs> Who wants to persevere through hard things? Who wants to say no to tempting things? It's a fruit of God at work in your life to regularly being say, saying no to something because you have a vision for a better yes. And let's get into God's word here. Jesus said it like this. Matthew 6, 16 to 18. When you fast, not if, When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. So I like this. It's going to get very like, it's a secret thing. It's personal. It's just, it's that ongoing daily conversation with you and God. It's the self-control to say, as you're listening to the spirit, no here, because yes, here. 
It's not like, oh, hey, everybody, I'm doing this so you can see me being spiritual. Jesus says, yeah, the little clap that you got, that's all you get. Yeah. <laughs> it's not about that at all. It's very, it, he's going to say it's secret. He says, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So there's this secret. Well, what, what's the most secret thing? You and God talking all day long. It's just about you and God. Talking with God. Listening to the Holy Spirit. Being led by the Spirit. Exercising that self-control to say no to some things because you have a bigger and better yes. And that's why Jesus says when you fast. It's when. It's not if. It's, it's not a bad thing. You know, we want to continue to develop that idea. It's there might be seasons like we just went through for a few weeks of a more intentional fast, but what we can see in God's word, especially when self-control is the fruit of the spirit, is that it becomes more and more a way of life. And that's what I want to challenge us on this morning is you're right on the edge of something. If you participated in the fast for, the, for that few weeks and said no to anything because you had that bigger and better yes in mind, the challenge is, is the Holy Spirit leading you and based on truth in his word that he's saying, hey, make that more of your way of life. Be, so that that better, bigger and better yes is more of a way of life. And now I'm not saying everything you fasted from like needs to just be never again. But there is a fasted way of life that Jesus shows us for the joy set before us, the joyful fruit of discipline, self-control. Jesus modeled himself this fasted way of life. He fasted for a season, those famous 40 days in the wilderness where he was tempted by the enemy. And even in just that one temptation about bread. So he's obviously hungry. He hasn't had food. And... The devil tempts him, you know, and says, hey, man, why don't you turn these rocks into bread? And Jesus' response is very deep. He says, humanity, man, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That word proceeding from the mouth of God, that's like that fresh bread <laughs> for the soul. It's the rhema word of God, like the now, like, the, like that the Holy Spirit is, it's either from the word that the Holy Spirit is highlighting afresh, or it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you afresh. It's that fresh word proceeding from the mouth of God. That's what creates communion with God. That's what creates an intimacy with God. That's what creates fellowship with God. God speaks to his kids. That's what John, Jesus said in John 10, 10. My sheep hear my voice. I call them by name. I lead them. That's that daily, active, powerful, personal presence of God. It's not, oh, the Bible has a bunch of great rules and truths and values that I follow. Although it has all of that, it's never meant to be absent from the fresh word proceeding from the mouth of God. The Holy Spirit leading us. We hear him. He's calling us by name. It's that personal. And so that's what Jesus' res response is to that deep moment of temptation while fasting. And, and is, is it even wrong for Jesus to feel hunger at that moment? No. So that, that, that temptation, so to speak, that craving, that impulse to feed his hunger has got to be at a human level unbelievably high. But in that moment, he says, no, because I am pursuing my better yes. That fresh communion with God, the Father, through the Spirit that word of the Lord that bonds us together, that speaking and hearing of his voice, that fellowship. The reward of fasting is right in there. That's what 
Jesus is showing us. He teaches us that there's a secret reward when we say no in the moment to impulse and yes to greater vision. Well, what's the greater vision? More communion with God. Deeper intimacy. Fresh fellowship. That is the reward that we're seeking after. That's what Jesus models he is doing in fasting. Jesus says no to a current desire for food, which is not even wrong, because he has a better yes, namely more intimate communion with God. No to a present impulse because he sees the vision of reward, which is fresh Holy Spirit-filled fellowship and communion with God. And so from Jesus' own, you could say, soul-satisfying experience of fasting, he then teaches us to fast, saying, when you fast, when you fast, not for any external reward, but for that secret reward of living in that close, unmatched, intimate relationship with God. More of God's presence. So as this kind of understanding of fasting emerges, we can see how fasting is much more than just food. It can be applied to virtually anything and and can be done in seasons, but in many ways should also increasingly become a lifestyle for Christians exercising self-control. Regular, regularly saying no to things because of the bigger and better yes of the reward. More intimacy with God. So Jesus' vision, what he models, what he teaches is not at all about religious legalism. It's about cultivating a lifestyle. Cultivating a way of life of disciplined, self-controlled choices toward the vision of the best possible yes that is your purpose for existence, which is knowing God increasingly intimately. And yet, and this is where I get more and more convinced that what I'm saying is true, and biblical and needed about a way of life, self-control being the biblical example. Because we live in a world that is the utter opposite of everything that I'm talking about right. right now. When they say we live in a consumer culture, to to think through that and realize that we are the target of very smart, very clever, very rich organizations, businesses, corporations who are going to get even richer if they can convince us to consume more and more and more. Think of the catchphrases that we are like, you know, fish in water, frogs in the pot. Every day, they're so normal. Things like on demand, get it fast, grab and go, Insta cart, same day delivery. I mean, same day, goodness gracious. (laughs) Amazon changed the world when it was two-day delivery. It, like, changed the world forever. Changed our brains on what to expect. And now it's getting to be same-day delivery to where I am offended if it doesn't come, like, by tomorrow. (laughs) I'm a frog in the pot, right? Door dash. Drive through. Don't wait. You deserve it. It's one of my favorites. Saw it in the grocery store. Oh my gosh, I just, it's everywhere. You deserve it. It's on TV. You deserve it. Look for that phrase. You deserve it. Now you deserve it. 
I saw one last night, pointed it out, nine o'clock at night, driving home from a basketball game for my son, and we're at the gas station. And now they, they gotta keep up in the ante, you gotta keep buying more, consume more. The phrase next to pumping the gas for all those, you know, treats inside. If you buy 50 bucks of gas, then for 99 cents, you can get 200 grams of sugar. And <laughs> now it's not just you deserve it. It's you deserve extra. That's the new phrase. And I'm like, wait a second. I can't even keep up to preach this stuff. A month ago, it was you deserve it. Now it's, you not only deserve it, you deserve extra, so the deal's better. So now for 99 cents, you can get 400 grams of sugar. <laughs> it's like, wow, if this is a fact, this is facts. This is all true. This is the world we live in. It's coming hot. It's coming fast. And that's where, to me, it's like, if we're not aware and sober to realize the hundreds of different ways on a daily basis that we are getting our instant gratification impulses are getting tempted and tantalized on purpose. If we don't recognize that, then, then the, they got us and we're going to be in it. And that's the goal. Don't think about it. Just expect Instacart. Just expect you deserve it. Just expect on demand. Just expect one day delivery and just go with it, man. Feels good. Easy, comfortable. Bam. This is a lie. The abundant life of a satisfied soul will not be found through following and feeding impulsive desires for instant gratification. I had to read that one because my, my wife told me to say it. So. <laughs> the abundant life of the satisfied soul will not be found through following and feeding impulsive desires for instant gratification. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Fasting is about the self-control and discipline that's learning to say no to instant gratification. And this is where I get very convinced that it's meant to be a way of life for followers of Jesus because of that instant gratification impulse that's getting played upon a hundred times a day by companies wanting to make you their slave so they get rich. That's where it's like, whoa, wait a second. This is why self-control matters. This is why Discipline matters. I want to go into the game of life every day knowing the game they're trying to get me to play, knowing how they're trying to play me and say, I'm not getting played. I'm not going to be your slave. I know I am tantalized by 200 grams of sugar. I'm going to know ahead of time you're trying to get me to do that just not even thinking about it. Every time I stop, you know, four times a day, five times a day, you're trying to get me to think that instantly gratifying whatever is going to be the pathway to satisfaction. The Bible is saying the opposite. And so I'm going to try to fight with that. So you got to get ready and you know what got to have things to fight with. Like I fight with this right here. Nothing tastes as good as communion with God. Nothing, as they tell me all the stuff, that's going to make me feel better, feel good. Nothing feels as good as God's presence. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. These kind of things, that's fighting back. And also having honest conversations with ourselves. You probably did that in the fast a bit. But covered in grace knowing I'm perfect in Jesus' eyes because he's perfect and I'm under the shelter and the shadow of his wings wrapped in his robe of righteousness, perfect in his eyes. I have courageous conversations with myself and God like this. God, show me where I'm a slave to impulse. Show me where I'm not acting out of self-control and discipline, but acting as a slave to impulse. It's a bold conversation to have. 
There's no shame in what you find. If you're covered in grace, there's actually just something God's revealing because he wants to heal. He wants to take you that much deeper into intimate communion with him as the satisfaction of your soul. And we're all on a journey here. So there is no condemnation. There is no shame. We're not going to like, hey, write down your list and compare it with your neighbor and be like, oh my gosh, that guy's that. No, this is the secret fasting. This is why it's a secret. Just you and God for the reward of just more of him. And I'm getting more and more excited about that because I've done the instant gratification thing in the world. Or you're not a good American. So we're all in this together. And let's, can we just say it doesn't satisfy your soul? It might tantalize in the moment. It might feel good in the moment. But is it transforming you to be more like Christ? Is it taking you into the throne room of God's presence? Those are the, 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 the true bread of life. Those, that's the true prime rib for the soul. That's the richest affair that we're made for. That's our purpose, is knowing God deeper and deeper at that level. So it really becomes like, man, we could fast from a lot. And that's an interesting journey, a secret personal journey for you to go on for the sake of God being the treasure of your soul. And for the sake which gives him the honor and glory he deserves. And when God's the highest treasure of your soul, guess what? Your soul is satisfied with the richest affair. He's the only one that can satisfy in the deepest places. So God set it up pretty cool. <laughs> he gets the glory, you get the joy. But we got to be willing to come back to the reality that on our part, there is some discipline. There's some choices. There's some work and some effort not to earn grace or earn salvation, but to put under control those things of, of impulse. That's why Paul says things in multiple places like, <laughs> your old self has died, so put to death your old self. Paul, what's up, buddy? <laughs> it's like, if it's dead, why do I have to put it to death? Well, let's just get real. I mean, is that not how life works? I got to put to death that impulsive desire for something that I know I don't want to keep going back to. And when I make the effort and intention and focus to put it to death, then by God's grace in me and with me, I, there's some success in putting it to death. But then if I stop and do something else or focus my energy somewhere else or give in, then that little sinful desire resurrects like a little zombie that just won't die. That's just a fact. So that's why Paul can say, hey, the old self has died with Christ. It has been buried with Christ. So, and then he says, so put it to death. Here's to me a quick interpretation of that. And this is off script, so sorry you don't have the scriptures. It's in Colossians, it's in Ephesians. You being a new creation, Christ in you, the new self, the spirit indwelling you is what, breaks the power of sin. You are forgiven, but you have a new nature. And so now the power of sin is broken and can be broken. Before the veil is lifted, you cannot overcome sin. You cannot overcome temptation. You cannot overcome slavery to impulse. The Bible says you're a slave to sin. We're slaves to sin. In Christ, that sin nature has been put to death. So now there's the, as we walk with God, we can live into that where we put it to death. Before, that wasn't even a possibility. Now, in communion and connection and conversation with God and stewardship of our life, the self-control, the discipline, what Jesus makes possible, you can live into. 
And so that's where it comes back to, on our part, there's discipline and self-control in the relationship. Paul says it like this. And he compares it to something that is profoundly relatable in their culture and ours. Let's check it out. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. That's a fasted life. Exercise self-control in all things, everything, because of the goal they have, what does he say? Of a prize, a perishable prize. Paul's already knocking it, saying like they're doing it for something that's not eternal. They exercise self-control in all things. They live a fasted life for the goal set before them of their championship. So their entire life is regulated around optimizing their athletic prowess so they can win the championship. Paul says, do the exact same thing for God. He goes on to say, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, an imperishable. We what? Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it for their championship. We do it for our championship. Do what? Exercise self-control in all things. He says, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He takes an example from the most disciplined area in society, and he says, that's a really good example of discipline. That's supposed to be the normal Christian life. Self-control in all things. Disciplined in all things. Because we have the in eternal, not perishable championship of knowing God now and welling that up all the way into eternity. There's nothing worth more than that. There is no greater prize to win other translations say, so I run to win. I like that. Run to win in your life. Don't run to lose. <laughs> we know this. We approve and appreciate this when we see this in athletes, right? I mean, we're about to come up on a Super Bowl uh, trophy acceptance speech by the Super Bowl MVP just a few weeks from now. You know, maybe it's uh, Brock Purdy from the 49ers. Maybe it's uh, Mahomes from Kansas City. Here's their speech. No, let me go this way. Here's what you guaranteed $1,000 bet right now. I'm not a betting man. But I'm throwing it out there. You do not hear this from the MVP of the Super Bowl. Yeah, well, you know, last, last year, after we lost, uh, it was heartbreaking. So, I took some me time over the summer. I just sat on the couch. I drank beer. I got really good at Fortnite. And I just came back, and I just let my talent destroy all you punks, fools. And I drank Gatorade. 200 grams of sugar. <clears throat> No one says that because they're not foolish enough, and it's not even possible. These are elite athletes. They always say the same speech, which is something about, I worked my butt off in the off season. I worked harder. I got to the grind. I worked so hard. Thanks for all of my teammates for working hard with me. You know, we, we were the first in the, on the field, you know, first in the gym, last out of the gym. I disciplined myself more than I ever had. I got back to the grind. I kept getting better. I kept working harder. I kept ratcheting up being disciplined in all things, essentially is what they say, every time. Because that effort is what trains them 
to be the best possible athlete. And Paul says, that's a great example for what the normal Christian life is about. So any example you can see in society of people making disciplined, self-controlled choices of saying no to things because they have a better yes, Paul says, take that as exactly how you're supposed to live the Christian life. Self-controlled in all things because of the vision of the reward more communion with God. And I never understood the last verse until recently. He goes on to say something that's like, what? He goes on to say, I, but I, so I discipline my body and keep it under control. Discipline, self-control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And I honestly always looked over that verse. I was like, I don't even know what he's talking about. He is admitting that if he doesn't stay self-controlled and disciplined, it could go in a bad way. His life could go in a bad direction. He's saying, lest after I preach to others what God's all about, that I myself would be disqualified. Now, I don't, he doesn't define what disqualified means, but he's using that sports analogy, like out of the race, out of the game, out of the championship, you don't win. So I don't know exactly what he means, but it's not good. <laughs> and he's saying, I need to stay disciplined and self-controlled so that after I've helped so many other people, I don't myself become disqualified. Meaning, you never get over self-control and discipline. You never get to a place where you're like, all right, well, cool, I achieved that, I'm good with God, and now I can just let go of all self-control and discipline. Paul's saying, never. It's a fruit of the Spirit that's meant to last forever. You as you get more self-controlled and disciplined and you see the great fruit in the communion with God, this starts to make sense of like, oh yeah, but I'm also only one little choice that turns to two little choices, that turns to three to five to ten. I'm only those many choices away from losing this present communion with God if I go seek my soul satisfaction in other places. And that's never going to change. And I'm, I'm not saying losing salvation. I don't even know what Paul means by disqualified. But if we're talking about the secret reward of fasting is more communion with God, it fits. I know it because I can feel it. As I've been growing in discipline and self-control and for that reward, it's very obvious I can mess this up anytime. I can choose that and that and that and that and that and that. And I know what happens when I do. It's, and I, I will lose that intimate daily hearing of the voice, simple, quiet communion with God, soul-satisfying fellowship. That happens as part of the result of, the reward of, self-control and discipline. And so it's like, wow, okay, this really is a way of life. <laughs> if I want communion with God to be a way of life, self-control and discipline are a way of life. And as we take that territory, we hit a new baseline, but it, it, we need to keep doing what we're doing to maintain it. Paul's saying, or we can lose it. Or we can keep being more self-controlled and disciplined and increase, fine-tune, like that elite athlete. Maybe they got to the Super Bowl last year. Fantastic. Many people never do. But they went home in the off-season and said, you know what, though? I can fine-tune this. I can train like this. I can train my mind, my body, my emotions a little bit tighter here to get even higher. 
That's the picture of our life forever. From one, because the goal is communion with God and Christ likeness. 2 Corinthians 3.18, as we behold him, we are transformed from one degree of glory to another. That's eternity, man. I mean, it starts now. We can become truly transformed more and more to be like Christ, but we're never going to be done. So it comes back to that. So we're never going to be done with self-control and discipline. And, and, and some of you out there are like, man, but that's just not my, that's just not my, my dealio. Self-control, discipline, that's hard. That sounds like willpower. That sounds like I have to work for it, and I'm a Protestant. I didn't know that was going to be funny. I was just talking. <laughs> well, what happens? I don't know. It, there's some very interesting... Join me for a moment down a little rabbit trail. There is very recent neuroscience. I'm going to recommend a podcast by Dr. Andrew Huberman. He is a brain scientist, a neuroscientist, where they recently discovered essentially the seat of willpower in the brain. I, I asked my wife for the name of it, so I didn't... What's that, my... Amazingly smarter than me, doctor. The anterior mid cingulate cortex. Just so you know, we're not making stuff up. <laughs> anterior mid cingulate cortex in the brain, kind of two, one on each side. Here's where, I, and she goes, I'm like, babe, let me talk about this because you're so smart, no one will even get it. Let me like bring it down to at least my level. <laughs> like, which is one of the people. All right. The bottom line is, it's. That's the fancy name for like the seat of the willpower. And they know this now because of like brain scans and brain imaging and brain testing. And here's the bottom line, that, this, that new science is revealing this. Willpower is built. It starts with one choice. When you face the hard thing that you don't feel like doing, but you know it's the right thing and you do it anyway... A little bit of willpower is built. And they see it now. It's actually in your brain like a muscle that can get stronger. And so what they've noticed is the folks in their testing with the largest, whatever, mid-anterior singular cortex, we'll call it the willpower muscle in your brain. Guess who has the largest ones? Navy SEALs and athletes. You know who I want to be on that list? Christians. I want Christians to go in there and be like, these people are weird. They have the largest material in the little cortex. Because self-control is the fruit of the spirit. But what, so the example, it's, and why I'm saying this, it's Paul's example that now neuroscience is finding is real. Athletes, Navy SEALs, the people that intentionally say yes to the hard thing that they don't feel like doing actually grows a strength in their brain so next so the next time they can do it easier it's and then if they continue to choose the hard thing that they don't feel like doing again they actually get stronger again and can do something even harder so think about temptation in your life. Are you a slave to impulse? So maybe there's some things that are just huge and they feel so strong and big. Victory over that, of course, and all of this is covered by God's grace. Don't get me wrong. But he's waiting also for you to say yes to his lordship and obedience to his word, which says be self-controlled in everything. So it can start, don't start with the biggest thing in your life that you can't stop or that you can't say no to. Start with a small thing and get a victory. There's that thing you know you don't want to do. You don't feel like it today. I mean, it can be as small as, I don't feel like going to life group because I'm a little insecure. Do it anyways. Pray about it and just do it. 
I don't feel like going to church today. I had a bad week. People might think, they might, they, they, they see it. They see the shame on me. No, we don't, actually. We're not that smart. <laughs> Just go. You don't feel like it. Just do it anyways. All these little, like, I don't feel like it should be a red flag in our hearts. Often. If we, if we know it's a good and righteous thing and we get that little, I don't feel like it. Boop, 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 boop. Don't give in to instant gratification. Now's that time. Can you exercise discipline? Can you exercise self-control? And thank you. Amen. That was the angel just blessing it. If, if and when, and this is bathed in prayer, this is not, so this is a fun balance because it's bathed in prayer, but you got to choose too, so it's that yes, there's effort. That's why Ephesians 4 says, make every effort in your Christian life. <laughs> you matter. Your choices matter. Your decisions matter. Your effort matters. So this is that, right? It's just, it's a muscle. The willpower can get bigger. Like, so think of it like this because we know, let's say, the athlete. They go to the gym. They train. They might be really weak in one thing. So you, you don't start with 300 pounds on the bench press. You start, can you do a push-up? I'm serious. I'm serious. So you do one. Awesome. You're sore for a week. And it stinks. <laughs> You're like, I should quit. My body's telling me no. When you're not sore anymore, try two. When you're not sore anymore, try three. You build it. That is, it's so interesting that neuroscience is saying that's what happens with our will. We actually, by saying yes to God, by exercising discipline and self-control, we build strength. You build strength. And if you've ever conquered something where you say that used to be a temptation and, and you could say like, hey, I'm living in the freedom of Christ. That, that, that doesn't have a hold on me like before. You've built strength in its, and you, the brain scans can see it. But here's the thing what Paul's saying. If you don't keep it, you lose it. That's what the brain scans also revealed. So athletes and Navy SEALs, when they retire, if they don't keep up that same regimen of discipline and self-control, the post-mid-anterior singular cortex shrinks, and they have less strength to choose the hard thing than they did before. That's exactly what Paul's saying when he says... I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching, I myself should be disqualified. You get stronger when you make the hard decision with God's grace and help to say yes. That's your new normal. Now, if you make another hard decision with God, you are increasing strength. And you continue to make the hard decisions, you maintain it. But if you choose to be undisciplined and let go of self-control, you literally, physically, biologically and spiritually, because it's all connected, you lose it. It's fascinating. Your muscle in your brain atrophies, <laughs> as does your spiritual strength. I love when biology and God's word say yes. So thank you for indulging the rabbit trail, but it's just an confirmation of in God's creation, neuroscientists are finally catching up with the Bible. To confirm what Paul says, that man, can we be people that exercise self-control in all things for the sake of the prize, the reward of intimate communion with God. Let's, let's pray right now and we'll be done. Jesus, we pray you right now, remind us afresh of your grace. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Though there is challenge to grow, there is no condemnation. Thank you that we are covered by your blood. Every single one of our sins, past, present, and future is forgiven. And as Colossians 1, 19, 21 says, we are perfect in your eyes. Without accusation without blemish because we're covered in Christ. 
Thank you. And thank you that that now gives us the courage to say, I want to grow. I want to become more disciplined. I want you to show me those areas where I can be a slave to impulse because I, by your grace and partnering with you, want to get set free so that I can walk in more intimacy and communion with you, God. Let's, let's, let's be bold right now. Just between you and God, this is the secret fasting. Holy Spirit, would you show me one area where you are inviting me to say yes to something hard, to say no to something that I don't feel like or when I feel like or don't feel like doing what's right, I do the hard thing or something that I do need to just say no to. Lord, is there an area of self-control or discipline that you are wanting to highlight in my life so that I can walk more intimately with you? Dance a new dance like David Dan.